Shazazz Creations, your one-stop shop when it comes to customization. Totes, tees, tumblers, hats, and more. Looking for a customized gift idea for a graduation, birthday party, baby shower, or just a unique creation of your own? Check out Shazazz Creations as seen here on Whitney D TV. Female, black owned. Use my promo in the description box down below and let her know Whitney D of Whitney D TV sent you. Thank you. Bye. What's up, Jewel Gang? So I would like to address this white woman who goes by the name of Nikki Marie on Facebook. Her page is private, but her DMs are wide open. You see, this scarecrow thought it'd be a good idea to slide in a black woman's DM, bully and harass her over having a small disability. Pause and read. Pause and read. Pause and read. You see, this beautiful black woman you decided to harass for having a small disability when being compared to you is walking art. Black women are literally walking Picassos, which is why snow roaches like you envy us so much. You look like the cashier at HEB that has to call the manager every five seconds because you're too stupid to work the register. You look like splattered bird shit dried up on the side of someone's car. You couldn't match her beauty if she gave you an audio booklet with a step-by-step -step description on how to do so. And between me and you, I'm the bigger bully. Sit your ass down. Thank you. 
what up what up you guys welcome to whitney d tv first let's get into everything shall we welcome i would love to see where you guys are tuning in from so please make sure to place your city in the chat and i will make sure to shout you out what's that oh home of keeping it cute so you won't get the boot that's right make sure you guys please 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 keep it cute so you won't get the boot okay now what that means is that you do not have to agree with me or uh, my remarks or opinions this is my channel however and i ask that you respect me by respecting yourself whatever you have to say say it with your chest but make sure it is respectful okay now in regards to everything that's going on with the r kelly trial and things of that nature it is done so i ask that you please respect my chat and do not spam my chat with your hashtag free r kelly's or anything pertaining to that if we are not talking about the topic okay not for nothing you do not have to agree so your opinion is duly noted here okay if nothing further make sure you guys do not forget to stop like this video subscribe if you have not and sharing is caring so make sure you guys share this video so i can reach a broader audience okay now not for nothing if you guys would like to join the channel you can find the link located in the description box down below or feel free to look above that's right right there in the chat it should be pinned if it's not it should be by now okay not for nothing if you like to support me on a monetary basis you can support me by cash app through the money sign whitney d 2014 or make sure you look at the bottom of the screen and there is located other means of ways to donate to the channel paypal zell or cash out nothing more thank you and enjoy the show what up what up everybody welcome to the channel if you're new don't be go ahead and click the subscribe button to be a part of the witness gang to join the witness nation now let's get into this shall we hello you guys and welcome to the channel if you're new don't be Pause the interview to give Kelly a moment.
October 1st, everybody. <laughs> Happy October 1st, everybody. Okay. How are y'all doing out there? Okay. How oh, I see some cookies. I see some cookies. Shit. Not none, dog. A store like that. I ain't got none. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. Yeah. I want a cookie. Welcome, welcome everybody to Whitney D TV. Okay. I pray you guys are having a wonderfully stupid blessed Friday. Okay. Now, if you didn't laugh at any of that, something is wrong with you today. And I'm I'm gonna pray for you, okay? But not for nothing. Let's go ahead and get into everything. Um First and foremost, hey, Deanna. Hi, 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 hi. It's Quasha. Hi, Linda. All the way from the UK. How are you? Oh, was it? Or was it England? I, I don't know. Hey, honey. Hey, hey, Charnette. Hey, Aaron. Hey, honey. Bunches of OC. Welcome to see you back. Hey, Zoe. Zoe says, afternoon with from Wales, UK. Yes. I tried to tell them. I said, I always try to go on between the hours of 11... 45 a.m. Um, CS time for me and 12. So you guys, it'll probably be like anywhere. It'll be the evening for you guys, but it won't be too late. So, hey, 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 I'm happy you could catch me. Uh, finally caught it live instead of watching it on playback. Yes, I'm trying to get better at it, Zoe, for you guys, for you guys. See, and it's morning for us. She said, ha afternoon game. <laughs> hey, Alice. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, Katie. Bang, bang, bang. Shoot them up, Katie. That's my girl. She don't be playing. Y'all better watch out in the chat. Hey, West Coast. Uh, what's up, everybody? Hey, Shantae. All right, you guys. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm coming to you guys one time for the one time for the read because this evening we will be getting into um our Friday compilation like we always do, music and combo. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can join us tonight same back place but different time okay it's going to be 8 p.m central standard time and we just are going to have an open conversation miss angelo said that he is going to be pulling through we're going to have a good time tonight i'm excited this is not my 5k celebration turn up though i think that's probably going to come on um next week i'm just trying to get some some people that I, I'm connected with to come on and we chop it up. So y'all hang tight for that celebration, okay? But not for nothing. Um, I want to go ahead and get into everything. Um, we are going to be reading um, our Kelly's book, if you guys aren't aware, just popping in. We are going to be reading Solar Coaster, The Diary of Me, which is an autobiography of our Kelly, okay? So we're going to be discussing that. And um, before we get into everything, I want to first discuss what his former attorney had to say. So Steve Greenberg tweeted this. I have taken a lot of unjustified heat to <laughs> the hell you. That is very justified, brother. There was a right way to do the case creatively and professionally and a wrong way. When all you cared about was your own ego and ambition and having people who didn't matter cheer regardless of your tactics effect on the jurors and the case. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so, you know, this to me is extremely embarrassing because there we go again the inside fighting each other you know what i'm saying see i used to put them on a pedestal as the pc uh uh group but child they fighting each other and then now the lawyers are doing it like shut up like be quiet bro like stop talking on the matter you're not his attorney you're not in the fold so why are you talking but anyway, it's not for nothing. All his heat was justified, if you ask me, because you should have stayed out of it. You still should stay out of it. But not for nothing. 
you know, that is that on that. So we're going to go ahead and get into this read. Hi, Melissa. Hey, honey bunches. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get into this read, okay? Now, before we get into the read, I want to catch everybody up with where we're at on the read, okay? Because I know a lot of people that are just possibly coming in. You just heard that, oh, Whitney is always reading these book, this book or whatever. And let me make this very clear. Let me pull it down. Let me make this very clear to everybody. This is no kind of way, shape, or form a justification of um, what he's done to these victims. Yeah, ain't no more alleged, okay? Um, I'm just curious. I didn't even know he had a book, and many of us did not. Do not buy this book, though. If you want it, slide in my DMs, okay? But don't, 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 do not support this man in any way, shape, or form, okay? Hit, hit your girl up okay hit your girl up but um yeah don't support this man in any way shape or form i didn't even i didn't even purchase it myself okay all right thank you Charnette, for your cash donation got your cash out thank you so much you guys if you guys would like to donate um my cash out as well as paypal and zelle information is located at the bottom of thy screen okay two Thy channel leader, be true, okay? All right? Okay. So, hey, Brooklyn D. Hey, Layla. Layla said, hi, beautiful. Though I've been watching since I was sit. It's my first live, Nashville. Hey, welcome. Come on in here. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, Diamond, my beautiful girl. Hey. Okay, everybody, welcome. So, you guys are just in time, okay? Because, you know, we got some people that were sent, okay, by way of Plaintiff Jane. Shout outs to her. Uh, so let me get you guys caught up with everything because you guys got to catch up. Now, this book has 343 pages. We are 172 pages in this thing. We're about to wrap it up here soon, okay? But not for nothing. Those that are just tuning in, they, girl, come here, come here. Boy, come here, come here. Let me tell y'all what happened was. Child. So we find out early on that his childhood sweetheart friend, uh, that him and her, like probably about eight, nine, they go over to the little river or whatever, right? They weren't supposed to go over there because of a restricted area. But you know how we do, right? I always seem to just get away and, you know, get our bus in some trouble or whatever, right? So they go off to this restricted area, right? And then it's these, it's this gang, it's these bully of boys or whatever, right? Over there. And they're like, you know, this our turf, fool, back up, break yourself, right? And so they, you know, R. Kelly get in front of him like, bro, whatever. No, we're not going nowhere. We we over here. We chilling. We trying to do out the bills or whatever. You know, you know, less words maybe. And the big boy pushes his little friend girl and she stumbles into the river, into the stream. And R. Kelly can't swim. Robert can't swim, right? So the baby is, uh, is carried on down the stream and she hits her head on a big rock, right? And she dies. So we find it out early. Then we are we hear about the early stages of his grooming process with his uncle. Okay, how how is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you tell your kids stop being a tell-a-tell. When you tell your kids be quiet, don't say nothing. Those are grooming process, and you gotta watch how you tell kids not to say stuff. Right? I know they get on our nerves, right? But just don't tell your kids stop. Stop telling your kids stop being tell-a-tells. You as a mama, you as the daddy, you as the parent. You need to take in all that information and, and and filter out what is BS and what is concern, okay? But stop telling your kids, stop telling on people and all that stuff that's embedded in them. Not for nothing. I digress, right? So the uncle puts down some like rat poison or whatever for the rats, rats down in the basement, right? Well, the family dog eats it and dies. They find him behind a, a cooler, a freezer, or whatever, and the uncle was like, you're not going to tell nobody, right? You ain't going to say nothing. He was like, well, I can't lie to my mama. He said, you're going to lie today, okay? Well, mama finds out, give him a good whooping or whatever, you know, and that was that on that. Then we fast forward. He walks in on, I say, to be his sister, right? Because he never mentions who this girl is, but he mentions how he was in the living room, was getting late, he heard some sexual noises or whatever, right? We know they were sexual noises, but he didn't. He just heard moaning and groaning. So he goes off to see what it is, who it is. Come to find out it's some sexual relations going on in the room, right? And he opens the door like slowly just to watch. Well, as he was about to leave, the girl tells him, you don't have to leave. You can watch, but you better not say nothing. Oop, oop, oop. There go that second seed. 
both by family members, both by people that he trusts, right? Okay. So both of them tells him not to say anything, right? And so, boom. So he then sits there and gets perverted. That perversion spirit falls upon him because at that age, he should not have been seeing sex. Gay sex, straight sex is just not his, is, that's a child, right? So he's now seeing this interaction. Then from there, we hear about his uh, molestation from I, the same girl, which again, I believe to be his sister. He never says, but he does later on say it's Teresa, which is his sister, right? But he doesn't use them in the same context. I noticed that. I don't know if y'all noticed that. Anyways, so then he comes back, y'all. And this time, he's asked to take a picture of them in a sexual act, y'all. Yes, child. So come to find out, that's where the whole cameras and stuff come out. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why. Because I told y'all, y'all gonna remember me saying this. This man is a freak of habit. He goes back into a sort of habit for him, what's normal for him to do. And so... If, if y'all listen to this book, you'll understand. That's why I said uh, one time that this is actually somebody else said that this is like a blueprint to this to this pedo. Like for real, the build up and everything, because I mean, it gives it to you. But anyway, so boom, y'all. So he takes the picture of them in sexual positions and stuff like that. Right. And so that sparks that. Then we go on to hear about on the couch another day. He gets molested. OK, this woman rubs on the little po' baby's pita-wita and gets it aroused or whatever. Hold on, y'all. Rubs on the baby little pita-wita, okay, and gets it aroused. And he wakes up to it and he's like, what are you doing? Stop doing that. And then they were like, hush, you'll like it or whatever, right? And so, oh, y'all, let me plug up my mic because my I'm, I'm too low for me. It's better. So then... He gets aroused or whatever, and the girl then puts his little pita weeder in her mouth, okay? So then we hear, we fast forward, because we are far, far along in this book, y'all. You fast forward, you hear about how he has these dyslexia problems, Her, he hears more music in his head than he hears words, okay? He gets pushed along uh, through elementary, middle school until he gets to high school, and they're like, okay, nigga, you dumbass need to figure out what you're gonna do, okay? And they like, you know, we finna we finna put you out, okay? And so his music teacher's like, no, he's got a gift. Let me work with him, right? So they give him a time or whatever. Well, this fool just said, you know what, freak it. And he ditches school. And then he becomes a street performer and he makes it real big. And then he goes to an audition, couldn't read the script, but they pushed him along with that too. And then we hear about in high school. He has sexual relations with an older woman, okay? She need to be in jail. But anyway, I digress. So she, um, he, he tells her about that interaction, right? About them learning each other bodies. Then we go on to hear about a, a chick named Niece, but her real name is Lanice, okay? Lou Niece. And so Lou Niece is like this girl that, you know, he cheated on or whatever for the first time when he got big in the entertainment business, Okay. Then in turn, her trifling ass cheated back on, right? But you know, they kids, whatever, right? But what do you do with that emotion? What do you do with that feeling? You know, you don't have a father to tell you, hey, son, it's okay. He became a slut bucket, okay? So from there, that's where we leave off. We find out he was a stripper uh, for a week. Um, not necessarily a week. It was like, it was like, it was like six six months or whatever you know he used to dress up in different characters and stuff like that and he used to drop it like it's high drop it like it's high twerk 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 later it's time for the twerkling it's time for the twerkling okay pop lock and drop it pop lock and drop it dance too much booty in the pants dance too much booty in the pants dance too okay and so he accumulated his um money that way between the streets and shaking his booty meat, okay? So from there, he makes it big or whatever the case may be. And now we're getting into 12 play, okay? So he's performing 12 play. And the way he concocted 12 play is because he was trying to get through a concert, right? And so he made up this whole story about all the things he would do and the things in his mind that he had of 
Mary J. Blige. I didn't know that. Maybe I didn't know because I was like, what, two when she came out, right? But I digress. So not for nothing, okay? He turns this whole concert theory or scene into an album, okay? And so that's where 12 Play came in. And that's kind of like where we left off at in regards to everything, okay? Him getting into 12 Play and him getting signed. We we hear about Barry Hankerson. We hear now we're hearing about these um, artists that he's slowly but surely developing, okay? And so you guys are entering in at the greatest time of all. Why? Because now we finna get into possibly all the Aaliyah stuff, all, all of that, okay? Now, I just wanted to get you guys caught up, okay? I hope I illustrated that perfectly for you guys, okay? Y'all love those visuals. Tasty, isn't it? Wasn't Look at his body all over my body. Creep squad. All right. Let's go ahead and get into this. Read. Thank you, Cece. Cece says, we love you, Whitney. Thanks for all you do, boo. I love you too. Happy Friday. Hopefully, I'll see you tonight, child. Okay? Let me see what y'all saying before we get into this read. Uh, Cece said, hey, Whitney D, um, can you put up a new link to become a member, please? I'm having trouble getting to it. Okay? Yes. Um, Those that need that link, here it is. It's actually pinned at the top. But there you go. It's right there, baby cakes. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. We're gonna get into it. Nisha says, try not to get grease on the phone while I'm eating and chatting. I'm just saying. Uh, Katie says, Thank God I had a dream before this nightmare. <laughs> the question said, yeah, he couldn't count, so he seduced the obvious to do it for him, allegedly child okay all right y'all let's go ahead and get into this book okay pray you guys are having a super stupid blessed friday and if you're not laughing i don't know what's wrong with you uh cc says it says that page not available with some purple monkey oh okay let me do this i probably cut off some of the little dots or whatever all you gotta do cc okay if you go down to the description box it's down in the description box. Just click on the link. Just click on the link. Tell me if you have a problem then. Okay? Tell me if you have a problem. But we're going to go ahead and get into this read, okay? All right. You did that? So did you still have the problem? CC, you couldn't get in? Let me see. Let me try this. Sorry, y'all. Thank y'all for y'all patience. We're going to get into the read. I promise you. Let me get, let me try this other link down here. I'm going to get it. Okay. All right, CC. Try this one. Try that link. And I may, I may up, update my, my link. I'm going to uh, try that link. Okay. All right, you guys, let's go ahead and get into this read. Okay. Um, I need to update my, um, my link if that's giving you an issue. Okay. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get into this. Oh, well, ew, <laughs> I be getting on people's nerves out here, but I don't care. Y'all coming over here. Y'all better wake up everybody. No more sleeping in bed. Okay, that's the sign. Okay, I don't know what I'll be grabbing on my channel. That is it. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry to disturb the reading. You're not disturbing Nathan, okay? Okay, all right, y'all. Let's go ahead and get into this read. I'm excited. This book is hilarious. Hold on. Oh, oh, I forgot, y'all. I forgot. So he's, he goes off on tour. 
okay, or, or wherever he is in Europe somewhere, right? And basically, his mama not doing too good. But I think, you know, we finna find out that she died. Clearly, with the title being, she's teaching angels how to love. So, you know. All right, let's go ahead and get into this read. She's teaching angels how to love. When I arrived home from Europe, I was surprised to see my sister Teresa, old nasty ass, waiting at the airport. What's wrong? I asked. It's mom, she said. What about mom? She's gotten worse. We need to go see her. How worse? Much worse. Why didn't anyone tell me? Mama said not to. She said your tour was going good and she didn't want anything to mess it up. Where is she? Roseland Hospital on 111th Street. I raced over. My brothers were sitting in the hallway. A doctor was standing in front of the door to a room. Robert Kelly, he asked. I'm Robert Kelly. Let's talk before you go in there. Why? We need to talk. You need to prepare yourself. I was already scared, but the word prepare scared me worse. Prepare for what? I asked. Let's just sit and talk. Doctor, please just say what you have to say. Your mother has incurable cancer that has reached its final stage. You're lying, I shouted. I wish I were. I wish I could say there was hope. My mother says there's always hope. I'm sorry, Robert, but your mother is very near the end. When I opened the door, my heart fell to the floor. My mother looked like a completely different person from the one I'd seen just a few short weeks ago. I'd never seen her look like this before. She was so much smaller. Her eyes were as yellow as a yellow crayon. Her body was all shriveled up. I went to her side and started crying. Oh, baby, she said, you got to get out of here. I told them I didn't want you to see me like this. I had to see you, I said. I don't want you to have this memory, baby. I want you to remember when I was healthy and strong. No one told me, Mom. No one said you gotten too sick. It happened really fast, son. How can you forgive me? I asked. Forgive you for what, babe? For not being here. For not coming home. I didn't want you home, Rob. I wanted you out there singing. That's what you were born to do. I held her hand and said, Mom, I promise you, I'm going to be the best writer on the planet. Nigga. Now, nigga. Okay. First, you got to get down reading. Okay. Nigga. It takes one it's one step at a time, okay? For you, I'm going to be the biggest singer. I love you, Mom. I love you, Rob. I know that, baby. I, and I've already seen it coming true. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoa, nigga. You gonna be the best writer? Like, really? Okay. 
<laughs> okay, I gotta get back in character. Y'all stop. Now, please get on out of here and let me be. I need to be alone. I don't want you to be alone, mom. I can't live without you. I've always, I'll always be with you, Rob. You know that. I love you, mom. I love you, Rob. I left her room with tears in my eyes. I didn't know what to do or where to go, so I went to the studio. I had to be around music. I had to sing. To me, singing is like praying. <laughs> it's the most powerful prayer. Feeling on your boo hooty. I, 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 no comparison, nigga. You, 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 you're treading very, 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 very thin ice. It's the most powerful prayer I can send up. I was playing a song for you when the call came in. Joanne Kelly was gone. I stopped playing, put my head down, and just sat there. There were people around trying to come for me, but I didn't hear their words. At that moment, I heard a new melody. I didn't have words for it, but the melody was strong. It had my mother's spirit on it. I stayed in my head. I thought of recording the melody, but something stronger was pulling at me. I, I knew I had to go see my mother one last time. When I got to the hospital, I learned that they hadn't moved her from her room. I told the staff that I needed this one last time to be alone with my mother. I sat next to her bed and looked at her lifeless face. Cancer had been cruel to her. But when I looked at her, I remember her when she was still healthy and full of life. I looked at her hand and said, I swear this to you, mom. I swear this with God, as my witness, I will be the greatest artist in the world. I will do this for you because of how you always believed in me. I got up and left. People stopped me saying words I couldn't even hear. Uh, it may sound strange. I mean, it may sound strange, but my mind was fixed on basketball. The only thing I could think of that might get me through the coming out was just being out there on the floor, running and shooting and giving it my all. Now, the spirit of grief was so huge that only basketball could keep me going. I imagine there are people who, upon hearing horrible news, beat their fists against the wall. That's their way of coping. Mine, my way was a full court press, bouncing that ball on the hard wood floor. I exhausted myself by playing ball for the three straight hours now afterwards i went to the studio where that same melody kept echoing through my mind every time i started to sing it though i broke down and cried mom was like god to me she was the one who never judged me she never abandoned me she listened patiently to my doubts and fears she encouraged my hopes and dreams without my mother i felt there was no one to call on anymore. I cried like a baby, cried until I felt like I had used up every tear in my body. How could I go on? How could I live without Joanne Kelly by my side? I couldn't complete the 12 play project without paying tribute to my mother. I thought about the melody that had invaded my mind about the, about she had she had died it was still there but there were still no words to go with it 
I'm the kind of writer, nigga, there you go, you don't write shit, uh, who never chases a song. I wait until a song chases me. And though I knew the unwritten song was going to be one of the most important of my life, I couldn't force it into existence. I had to be patient. But I also had to dedicated song to jo Joanne Kelly. I thought back on, on her life and remembered how when I was just a little boy in the 70s, mom loved the, the spinners. She used to stop whatever she was doing when their lead singer, Phil Philippi Wine, started in on one of one of a kind love affair or mighty love or love don't love nobody. He also sang a song that talked about a mother named Sadie Mae. Sweeter than cotton candy and stronger than Papa's old brandy. Every line of that song made me think of my mother. I've never been inclined to record a cover song. I've always been proud of my originals but i knew that by singing sadie i pay my mother the highest tribute the song was out of her era now it was a song sung in the high style of soul that she had taught me to honor and while it's true that 12 play would turn out to be a record that broke records and busted up some old taboos an album that would be remembered for songs about sensuality and sex. The song that means the most to me is Sadie. My mother was my Sadie, my everything. I bet his mother turning over his grave. Don't be dedicating no damn song to me. You, you talking about feeling on booties, nigga. Mm -hmm, child, please. The depths of my struggles determine the heights of my success. Shit. <laughs> yeah. When my mother was still alive, I was a boy. After she died, I became a man. When my mother was still alive, my career was starting to build. After she died, my career blew up. The most tragic event of my 26 year old life, the death of my precious mother. <laughs> Jesus, sorry y'all. You'll be surprised, the most tragic event in your life. Uh, with the explosion of my music around the world because she was gone. I was sadder than I'd ever been in my life and not too long after my mother passed my grandmother lost her battle with cancer and went to join her daughter joanne because bump and grind became the longest lasting r b hit in the history of billboard a billboard ch chart not to mention a number one pop hit as well I was more successful than ever. Grief and joy had a hard time shaking hands. Now, my mom was like a mixing board where the tracks, the up-tempo, happy jams, and the deep, dark blues grooves were leaking all over each other. Now, I'd reach my goal. I'd become a superstar. And while I could feel mom's spirit still feeding me love, it hurt my heart that my eyes couldn't see her face. Now, she was no longer there to give me a hug. And man, did I need a hug. You need jail. Okay. Looking back, I remember feeling that I couldn't go on without my mother. And if my career hadn't taken the amazing turns that it did, maybe I would have broken down completely and spent the next year or two doing nothing but grieving.
but music wouldn't let me do that. My music took over and suddenly started sweeping the country. Now, suddenly I was famous, but fame almost overwhelmed me. It was like a hungry monster with an appetite that could never be satisfied. It wanted more, more. And then just when I thought it was satisfied, it asked for even more. Things were happening so fast that I could hardly keep up with myself. These were good things, musical gifts that were tremendous challenges and undeniable blessings. Take, for instance, the fine art of the remix. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, most hits, uh, hit records got a second life and sometimes even a third life. By releasing a remix version of the original, usually remixes were done by high engineers or producers to create new versions of a song, which was often for clubs. Now on the 12 Play album, I decided to do the remixes of um, my own records instead of having someone else do them because of the advances in recording technology and my growing confidence and experience in the studio i could see how to break down the different elements of the song and put them back together in a different conf configuration now i could modify the groove strip down the vocal and add new elements throw in new sounds and accents in short I could re-engineer the music in a way that gave it a whole new flavor. I did two remixes of Bump and Grind, the old school mix and the How I Feel It extended mix, which is the version of the song we shot the video to. I also did my first remix for Your Body's Calling. As the B-side of the Your Body's Calling single, all the remixes were a huge success. I don't know how many remixes I've done for Your Body's Calling. And I recently remixed Bump and Grime as a, as a choir version for my Love Letter tour. A choir. I saw the remix as a new art form to explore. I loved it as a canvas for sound. It wasn't that I no longer liked starting with a clean slate and creating a brand new song. I'd always liked doing that. But it was no longer either or. Now I could do both. Not only could I create a new feeling out of a previously recorded song of mine, I could do it for other artists as well. Just like that, I established another major career as the remix man, making matters sweeter, making matters sweeter. The remix of Your Body's Calling sold more copies than the original. By 1994, 12 Play had sold more than 5 million copies, and the sexy R. Kelly brand was established. Jobs president Barry Wiss um, publicly labeled me a pure artist and an old-fashioned creative genius. Jive had no problem happily allowing me to control my own creative destiny. This kind of artist power was a big boost to my ego. I was happy that my fans and the people I worked with accepted me as who I am. I didn't have to be phony or change my music or bow to the will and demands of others about my music. I was riding high as a real artist and a raising star. But according to my plans and definition of success, I still hadn't risen high enough. While 12 Play was rising on the charts, Janet Jackson's Janet album, was the biggest of her career. Janet, Jimmy Jim, and Terry Lewis wrote a beautiful song called Anytime, Any Place. Hey, anytime, hey, in any place. I don't care who's around. Yeah, see, yeah. I think she was talking about an underage teen. Um, 
it was especially appealing since earlier in her career, Janet had a hit with Let's Wait a While. See, and she probably was talking about somebody underage, but at least she said, let's wait a while, maybe wait until you become of age. Now, the waiting was over and it was cool anytime, any place. When they sent me the song to be remixed, I was ready. And when my remix went crazy on the charts, I saw that by reimagining songs that people already loved, I could enjoy another outlet for my musical energy. One thing was building a top another, and just when I thought it couldn't get any bigger or better, it did. Enters Michael Jackson. Oh, hell. Mm -mm -mm. Mike, you want to be starting something? You got to be starting something. What you doing, Mike? You are not alone. Shit. Mm -mm -mm. You aren't. You had a whole enterprise. You're right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. MJ. Shit. As a kid, I watched a lot of TV and loved much of what I saw. TV was my window into worlds outside our little home. Cartoons were wonderful. They were crazy fun. Sometimes I picture myself jumping into the cartoons and running after the characters. But I never thought the characters were real. Take Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse was a superstar of cartoon characters. Donald Duck was cool and so was Goofy. But me, I dug the Road Runner and Porky Pig, who stuttered. Remind me of Uncle Doug. Mickey no, was the boss. Mickey ruled the TV screen, but I knew he was just make-believe. Well, in a funny kind of way. I thought of Michael Jackson the same way. When the Jackson 5 popped into our lives, we loved them to death. We loved Michael and Jermaine and Jackie and Tito and Marlon. We knew one from the other who couldn't wait for them to come on TV and sing their songs about school like ABC. They were as cool as cartoon characters beyond human. And they were black, <laughs> like us. We'd been told the fairy tale myth of how Diana Ross had discovered them later. I learned that that wasn't true. But as a kid, I believed the myth. When the Jackson 5 were set to appear on American Bandstand or the Ed Sullivan Show, we got to the TV a half hour early so we wouldn't miss a single thing. A single minute. I was still a little kid, four or five, when the Jackson 5 actually became a cartoon show where the brothers were animated like Mickey Mouse. That closed the deal. They weren't real. Michael was Mickey Mouse. When Miss McGlynn came along and said that one day I'd be writing for Michael Jackson, I didn't believe him. And then when mom died and I leaned on Miss McLean even more, she kept saying the same thing. You are more than just an artist, Rob. You are a writer. Now, see, wise the lies. You know, you know, it can't write, right? You are a writer whose songs will be sung by the biggest artists in the world. I'd been going through some personal struggles and it seemed like everywhere I turned, I was losing people. Just before we were about to leave on the big 10 week, 12 play tour, the buses were gassed up, the equipment was loaded and I was sitting there waiting for my boys, the guys from the public announcement who still sang back up dance in my shows and on the videos to show up but they never did 
because of all my set routines with the guys, I had to change the show. I made the necessary adjustments. And to my surprise, none of the fans seemed to miss public announcement. They yelled and screamed louder than ever. The tour was a huge hit. Michael was on my mind when towards the end of the 12 play tour, we were in Gary, Indiana in the Jackson's hometown. I was also thinking about my mother and our travels to Gary to see my grandfather and how we'd sit out on the porch. He would play his guitar for us and my mother would sing. When the thoughts of Michael and my mother came together, out came a melody. The same melody that had continued to haunt me after my mother's death. After mom died, I lost a person very dear to me, whom I loved with all my heart and soul. Now, I wanted to let this person know that I would always be with her, even though we couldn't be together. So this time, when I heard the melody, the notes were caring words. The words were clear. They said, you are not alone. What? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. I didn't know he wrote that. I got this feeling in my gut. Goosebumps sent chills up and down my arms. I ran to the first piano I could find and started playing that melody and singing the words. You are not alone. It was my mother talking to me. It was me reaching out to an incomparable love one and letting her know that although we were apart, I would always be there for her. The further I developed the song, the more it sounded like Michael. I heard his in inflections, felt his spirit. I knew this was the right song for Michael Jackson. Once I got to Chicago, I went to the studio and put down a demo. By then, the whole song was there. Let's sing it together, everybody. One, two, three. Another day has gone. Come on. I am still alone. Can't hear you. How could this be? You are not with me. Come on now. You never said goodbye. Come on. Can't hear you back there. Uh-oh. Someone tell me why. I can't sing it for real, y'all, because I don't want to get no copyrights. Did you have to go and leave my world so cold? Every day I sit and ask myself, how did love slip away? Come on, y'all. Yes, I. Someone whispers in my ear and says, you are not alone. Give me, come on, put your lighters. I am here with you. Put your fire emojis. Though you're far away, I am here to stay. Just the other night. A stupid do, 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 do. Okay. So y'all know the song. I didn't know he wrote that. Did y'all know he wrote that? Wow. Hmm. When I sang on the demo, I purposely captured Michael's style, even catching the tones of his voice. That was easy since I'd been listening to Michael my entire life. I loved how Quincy Jones had produced Michael's Off the Wall. I loved Thriller and Bad. I knew Teddy Riley had co-produced Dangerous, and I really wanted to be in that company of those who had worked with Michael. I had my manager send him the song. A day passed. Michael Jackson's Michael Jackson was real. He looked at least eight feet tall. He looked like an avatar.
My manager called. He wants to do it, he said. Michael wants to do it, I replied. I mean, I repeated, you sure? His people called. They love the song. That's fantastic. That's amazing. I was shouting out the good news. But there's one thing, Rob. What's that? He wants half the publishing. Wow. Mm. The publishing represented ownership of the song. Much as I love Michael, and much as I understood that business is business, I believe that given the success of 12 Play, I earned the right to keep all my publishing and retain all the ownership. Tell us people, I said, no disrespect, but I don't want to do that. It will be the dream of my life to have Michael sing the, that song, but it's a song that I need to own. You sure, Rob? You sure you want to take this chance? I'm sure, I said. If Michael really loves the song as much as I like, as I think he does, he'll sing it anyway. He'll realize he was born to sing it. My manager conveyed my position to Michael's manager. One day passed, then another, and still another. I was nervous. I was thinking about nothing except whether Michael Jackson was going to sing my song. Then the phone finally rang. My manager was on the line. Well, well what? He said, teasing me. Is he going to sing it? Hell yes, he's going to sing it. Thank you, Jesus, I yelled. Not only is he going to sing it, He's coming to Chicago so you can show him how to sing it. When? Next week. You're kidding. I never kid about something this important, Rob. Not when it comes to you producing Michael Jackson. Me, producing Michael Jackson. He was going to sing, you are not alone. I kept running those words through my head. I still couldn't believe it. What better way to send a radio message than through the king of pop himself. I immediately got nervous and started to freak a little. It was all coming true. Michael Jackson was really getting on a plane and flying to Chicago for the express purpose of being produced by me in the studio, of course. My choice was CRC Studio, just off Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago. I knew it like the back of my hand. My engineers were the best. The atmosphere was cool. I knew Michael would be comfortable and we could ensure his private space. Wherever Michael Jackson went, though, the world knew about it. It was like there were secret agents putting out the world. So days before he landed in Chicago, the city knew he was coming. There were mentions in the newspapers and on TV. The whole town was wired for his arrival. I was wired. I couldn't wait. The day finally came. I got to, to the studio two hours early. I ordered my favorite Chinese food. I was sure to include some vegetarian dishes for Michael. I was so nervous that I started practicing in front of the food, just how I would introduce Michael. Would I say, Mike, would you like some Chinese food? Or, Mike, want some of this, man? Or maybe, I better to say, if you're in the mood for some Chinese food, Michael, you're welcome to it. I was in the middle of all this when the studio phone rang. The engineer answered. All I heard him say was, okay. Hi, Angelo. What up, Angelo? Thank you for joining the reading. What up, what up, what up? 
what's up i asked they said the talent has landed and is 30 minutes away michael's people has specified that they wanted only me and my engineers present during the session my manager though had showed up like everyone else he wanted to meet michael the phone rang again talent was 20 minutes away i went back I went back to rehearsing how to offer my Chinese food. Then another call, 10 minutes away. I went to the bathroom to wash my hands, super clean. I knew Michael didn't like dirt. He was a clean freak. He didn't eat meat. That's why I had those vegetarian meals ready. The talent has arrived, my engineer announced. Three minutes later, his security guys appeared. They made sure they knew who was who they made sure that the route from the car to the studio was clean next we heard that the talent was in the building and the next thing i knew michael jackson was walking through the door michael jackson was real he looked at least eight feet tall he looked like an avatar he was wearing a black mask over his face. Only his eyes were showing. My manager was the first to make a move. He went over to hug him. Michael stopped the hug and offered his hand instead. Then my manager introduced him to my engineers. Michael shook their hands. Finally, Mike walked over to me. He looked in my eyes, opened his arms, and gave me the hug of my life, whispering to me in his lighter than air, soft, high voice. The world's going to be singing this song. I blurt out something silly like, congratulations on everything you've done, Mike. Congratulations on being Michael Jackson. Just about then, bubbles. The chimp prance into the room. In my mind, I call <laughs> I call Bubbles. <laughs> Trouble. The chimp made me nervous. <laughs> He's friendly, isn't he, Mike? Oh, yes. He's not going to hurt you. Anyway, I said, I'm just glad you like the song. I don't like it, Rob. I love it. I don't want to change one thing. I want to sing it just the way you wrote it. You captured me beautifully. That's the reason I came here. We can get started as soon as I... Y'all stop. I'm going to turn my phone over. I'm done. I'm not looking at the comments. <clears throat> we can get started as soon as I do my vocal warm-ups. If you excuse me for a, a minute, I said, I'll be right back. I walked to the bathroom and just fell out on the floor. I broke down and cried. It wasn't that Michael Jackson was singing my song. It was that Michael Jackson had felt how I caught his spirit. Michael Jackson had come to Chicago to work with me. When I got back to the studio, I heard screeching. I thought it was Bubbles throwing a fit, but it was Michael doing his vocal warm-ups. <laughs> he was screeching like a wounded animal. <laughs> Man, I thought this is a strange way to warm up, but he's Michael Jackson, the biggest star in the world. And if that's how he wants to warm up, it's cool with me. Before we start working, Rob, said Mike, would you mind talking to my vocal coach in L.A.? He has something he wants to ask you. No 
problem, Mike. When we reached him, the coach said, Mr. Kelly, Michael just wanted to ask if it it be okay if you only did the first verse today. You can start on the chorus tomorrow. That will help Michael conserve his voice. Sure thing, I said, amazed at Michael's humility. He had asked his coach to ask me if it was okay to work on Mike's timetable. Thanks for understanding, Mom. <laughs> Thanks for understanding, Rob, said Michael. I hope this won't mess up your flow. I flow with you, Mike. Anything you want, man. For the next few hours, we worked the verse with Michael trying as hard as we could to be true to my demo. It's better, it's better than the demo. I kept telling him, way better. Next day, of course, I was less nervous. I knew the chorus was a killer and Michael would nail it. Michael would nail it in no time. When he started singing, though, he immediately felt the need for background vocals. Rob, he said in that high sing-song voice, would you mind coming in here and singing backgrounds with me? Mind? Are you kidding? Michael Jackson was asking me to sing with him. I had to practically stop myself from running to the vocal booth. Pace myself so I could walk slowly, but in my heart, I felt like a little girl. A little girl, nigga. Why not a little? What you mean? Okay, whatever, nigga. Whatever your preference. When we started to sing, the blend was perfect. We were butter and toast. He did that same rocking motion I'd seen him do on We Are the World. Sitting there next to me, my voice over his, his voice over mine, I taste heaven, heaven on earth. Brother, this is as good as it gets. You know, Rob, he said later that afternoon, sometimes it can take me a month to get a song where I want it. Me too, Mike. I agree. Sometimes it takes me more than a month. I'm glad you understand. You'll be patient with me, won't you? I'll be whatever you want me to be, Mike. It's still like a dream for me. Can I ask you something else? Sure. Is there a mall around here? Just a couple of blocks away. Would you go there with me? I love malls. I love them too, Mike. Let's roll. With Bubbles and the security team in place, <laughs> Oh, God. <clears throat> With Bubbles and the security team in place, we went to Water Tower Place, one of the nicest malls in Chicago. Michael headed straight to the Disney store, where he was fascinated by a larger-than-life statue of Donald Duck hung above the entrance. That's beautiful, said Michael. Do you think they'd sell it to me? I'd love to have Donald Duck for Neverland. Couldn't hurt to ask, I said. Of course, Michael Jackson walking into Disney store caused a near riot. When the manager appeared, Michael couldn't have said have, couldn't have been sweeter. Is there any way I could buy that Donald Duck? He asked. I'm afraid not, Mr. Jackson. I'm permanently uh, it's permanently built into the front of the store. Oh, that's a shame, Michael said politely. But thank you anyway, sir. I never met anyone with better manners. We spent the next three weeks perfecting the song. As far as the production went, Mike, let me take the lead. Now, of course... He had ideas for instrumental touches of his own, and they were all great. We never had a single disagreement. Now, after the session, 
he'd hang around the studios to talk. He was interested in my remix methods. He loved the remix on Your Body's Calling. He wanted to know how I how I done it. When I explained what I worked by instance, um, he completely understood. The experience of working with Mike was drama free. Every night after he left the studio and got in his van, people were hanging out the windows of office buildings and hotels, stretching their necks to get a glimpse of him. He'd always stop and wave. When the job was done and it was time for him to leave Chicago, he gave me another hug and said, you are my brother. I was too choked up to say anything. When You Are Not Alone dropped as the second single of Mike's history album, it made the Guinness World Record book as the first song to debut at number one on Billboard Top 100 chart. It was number one in the UK as well as in France, New Zealand, Spain, Switzerland, and Japan. Mike was right. They were singing it all over the world. Now, when the video came out, Featuring Michael and Lisa Marie Presley, his wife at the time, I loved it for being so original. It got everyone talking. Unfortunately, the credits on the record listed Michael as, an, as a co-writer of the song. Naturally, that got me a little upset. But the minute I put a call in to Mike, he got right back to me. I'm so sorry, he said. My people are so used to me co-writing everything. They presumed I'd done this as well. But mark my words, Rob, this mistake will be taken care of immediately. And it was. It would be some years before Michael cut another song of mine, One More Chance, for his number one compilation album. Before that, he invited me to his LA studio, just as a guest. I winded up singing on this on that session and having a ball. We talk every three months or so. He tell me what was happening in his life and I tell him about mine. Michael Jackson died on June 25th of 2009. News of his death was like a hatchet to my chest. He meant to me what breathing means to most people. He was not only my brother and friend, he was also my mentor. Mm. I am honored and blessed to have been in Michael's presence. I got to know him like most of the world never will. On a person-to-person, soul-to-soul level, I broke down and cried when I saw a YouTube video on Michael dancing to Ignition Remix. Now, in the back seat of his friend's car, I mean, he was jamming. You can tell he was fully into and feeling it. I was like, wow, he's doing my music. He's singing to my music. I've been in the business for over 20 years. I've written songs that have sold around the world and won all kinds of awards, but it wasn't until I saw the great Michael Jackson busting his familiar moves to my song that it all became official. Kells is here, baby for real. In late 2009, one used part. <laughs> Chell. Mm-mm-mm. I used part of that video in a tribute to Michael as part of my chore. The YouTube video surged into a montage of his performances and personal videos. After it played, I walked out on the stage and sang words that came to me after his death. Don't say goodbye to me. There is no need to. Don't say goodbye to me because I'm still with you. Don't say goodbye to me. Don't shed a tear because I'm still here. Go light a candle and say a prayer 
scream out victory because love is still there. The tribute was my way of keeping Mike with me, with all of us. Really, I refused to let him go and was determined not to let him die because he was superhuman. I was sure that Mike will live forever. Y'all doing okay? Mm -mm -mm. This look like the trap in the closet days. Oh my God, a rubber, rubber. Mm-hmm. Mm. -hmm. mm. Trade in my life. I wonder to who? The devil. Let's keep reading, y'all. So I'm just getting a little drink. Hey, me, myself, and I, welcome. Trade in my life. I understand this is about me. There's a studio basketball court the crib and the road the studio comes first in the studio the lady is music and she possesses me more deeply than any woman we know mm -hmm. we know now i need the basketball court for release the comp the competitive fire inside me needs to burn if i don't burn it off it'll burn me up I need a crib for privacy and protection. I love my fans, but some of them are aggressive to the point of craziness. Uh-oh, here we go, y'all. He's getting good. See if he talk about Ja Ronda, you know, the super fan, underage super fan. In 1994, one found a converted church in the Lakeview section on Chicago's north side. An upscale in the city hood near Lincoln Park, the lakefront in Wrinkley Field. Now, I saw the this the place with its 10,000 square feet of living space as a blank canvas that I could paint any way I wanted. I'm a perfectionist in music and I'm a perfectionist in design. I was going to design this, my first major home according to my vision. For example, I envisioned an indoor pool. Oh, got, we are aware of that. And basketball court and a spacious indoor rehearsal slash dance studio. I wanted a 27-foot stairwell in the living room, polished hardwood floors in the dining room, elaborate lighting, and breathtaking art throughout the house. Now, there simply had to be monster sound and home theater system and a great room with a grand white piano as the centerpiece. I had a massive 1500 gallon in the wall aquarium installed with a pair of killer sharks swimming inside. We know. I got that idea from a James Bond movie I saw. Thought it might make my place unique and give it attitude. My house was a place where I could take off the R. Kelly uniform and let Robert do his thing and be himself. We know, nigga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's definitely Robert. The little boy with the traumatic experiences. You had fun in that house, you bastard. In an interview with Vibe magazine in 2007, John Monopoly, at the time manager of Kanye West, Shawna uh, Shana and Rhythm Rhythm uh, yeah Rhythm Fest talked about his experience at a house party I had once thrown. It was the it wasn't the house I just described, but the so-called hood shit. Monopoly described it hasn't changed. Um, he watched women braiding my hair and how we hung out in the kitchen singing, laughing, and talking shit to Monopoly. This was a sign of my authenticity. 
from his perspective, is demonstrating my strong bond with the public in connection to the streets. Well, what Monopoly witness seemed to convince him that I had genuine street cred back in 1995 as in 2005, as in today. If you are hanging with me, I'm not R. Kelly. I'm Robert, a mama's boy who lives life and enjoys his life, his family, his friends, and his home. In fact, being connected with real life and real people is the only way my music can stay relevant. People tend to pamper R. Kelly, but with Robert, they can let their guard down and crawl on the ground to 17 year olds and say what's on their minds and hearts. R. Kelly moves too fast and tries to please too many underage girls and boys. That's not a bad thing. In fact, it's good because it keeps me connected with my fans. But when I separate myself from the character and come down to earth, it's Robert who picks up on the real vibes in the streets. The road was always calling and calling me because it all allows me to connect with my fans all around the world. I want to see them and they want to see me. I want to entertain them. I also found myself in the same position as thousands of male singers who came before me. Now, now if I sing a song that was that that says I want to seduce you and you alone, a woman takes that personally and I want her to take it personally. I want the woman to feel like I want her. And I want her to want me. All that translates into lots of ladies wanting me. And in turn, me wanting lots of ladies. Not too many years before I was at a school. I, I was a school kid with a reading problem whom the girls laughed at. And suddenly... The kid became a superstar with a lifetime pass to an all-you-can-eat buffet. And on the menu is every kind of beautiful woman, man, cat, dog. You can imagine. Every shade and every shape.
Oh, y'all, I'm sorry. I'm just reading. Lord, let me go back up. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> My bad. Okay, let me start back up. Okay, where was I? Right here. Okay, okay. Suddenly, the kid became a superstar with a lifetime pass to all and all you can eat buffet. And on the menu is every kind of beautiful woman, cat, dog, baby, child, man. You can imagine it. Every shade and every shape. I was excited that my songs were so strong. Excited that my female fans liked the seduction. Excited that women were looking to seduce me. And I said, hell yes. My love life started operating on the same level as my musical life. It was one gorgeous song after another. But even though I had this spirit of seduction, I also have a spirit that comes from God. The preacher in me is strong. When mom passed away, she went straight to heaven. I truly believe that. The only way I'm going to see her again is to make it to heaven. After her death and all the sudden success, not to mention this hurricane of women. Coming at me. I was thrown into some serious confusion. The preacher and the seducer got into an argument. In 1995, at the start of my second solo album, R. Kelly, I decided to let my fans know everything going through my mind. But I wanted the preacher to deliver the message. Earth is my preacher's turf and people related to him because they feel he's talking directly to them. The preacher is my music and my music, although it's not the same as going to church preachers. The intro on the record was called The Sermon. I preached like I was in church. A church organ playing between my words with the sisters and brothers are responding to my calls, yelling amen and preach, Brother Kelly, with your trifling. I said, before I start, I just want to get a few things off my chest. Uh, you see, being in the business that I'm in uh, looks like everything I do, uh, everywhere I go, uh, and everything I see uh, seems to be through some kind of uh, magnifying glass. Uh, can I talk about it? Uh, while you're looking, I suggest you take a good look, and I hope you find just what it is you are looking for, just like that song. Ain't nobody's business what I do. Now can I move on? I remember when I was trying to be somebody, but I just didn't know nobody. But ever since God has blessed me, uh, it seems that things are going a little bit different. Uh, can I get an amen? Uh, folks, ain't it funny uh, how things can change sometimes? Why even the Statue of Liberty uh, want some bump and grind? Uh, can I get a witness out up in these jeeps? Uh, <laughs> amen, you old trifling. Um, blasphemous son of a God. Okay, blasphemy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I don't see nothing wrong with a little truth. You see, the good book says that the truth is the light. I think it's time to turn on your lights and see the truth. Can I talk on it? You don't know where I've been. You don't know where I'm going. You don't know what I do. Can I get a witness? Witnesses? Hell no, nah, don't give him nothing. 
So before you go trying to pass judgment on me, pass judgment on yourself. Worry about yourself and what yourself is doing, where yourself is going and who yourself has been with. That way you don't have to ever worry about nobody but Jesus. Okay, nigga. From the pulpit, I had to get right to the dance floor. You remind me of something. The first single from our Kelly album got some serious criticism. I wonder why, nigga. But that didn't bother me. Of course not. You, you the devil. Of course it's not going to bother you. From the pulpit, I had to get right to the dance floor. You remind me of something. The first single from our Kelly album got some serious criticism, but that didn't bother me. I was proud of the song because I was freer with my metaphors. I've always wanted to express myself in ways that other guys never have. I was glad to write, you remind me of something. I just can't think of what it is. You remind me of my Jeep. I want to ride it. Something like my sound. I want to bump it. Girl, you look like my car. I want to wax it. And something like my bank account. Well, we can't talk about that now, huh? <laughs> I want to spend it. Yeah, you did that. Found uh, paying all them people on the tables. You, you, you did that. Mm -hmm. You know, you spend all of your money on that girl. So pull up to my bumper and let the system sound. Hey, girl, I bet you I can drive you crazy. Yeah, you did. You drive all these people crazy. Uh huh. Try it. The song is a compliment to women, not an insult. We fellas love our Jeeps. We love our cars. We love the speaker systems in our rides. And naturally, we love our bank accounts. When we got money, yeah. Make sure you put that in there, nigga. You can compare a woman to the moonlight and stars. You can compare her to a beautiful flower or an angel from above. Oh, that's cool. But I wanted to come down to earth and make a comparison that was real to men. Now, I was happy the song got talked about, and I don't think I'm wrong in saying that the fans got a kick out of the lyrics. They proved that to me when they ran out and bought the single, and it wound up hitting number one spot. The power of music uh huh, inside me didn't pay any attention to debates about my musical direction. It simply kept feeding me more and more lyrics, words, riffs, and rhythms. It got to a point where, and I know this may sound crazy, I talked to the notes in my head. This nigga was crazy. This nigga was crazy. It got to a point where, and I know this may sound crazy, I talked to the notes in my head. Child, you remind me, you remind me of a toot toot beep beep, I'll dip beep boop, or doop doop doop. But this nigga was crazy, okay? I made them prove that they were worthy of completion. Come on. That all you got? What else? Bring it. 
this nigga was saying all this to himself. Nigga was schizophrenic. Tourette's bipolar. And see, they didn't they didn't plead insanity on the y'all. So yeah. His his lawyers were were sorry, because baby, I would have brought this book up and say, see, he was talking to notes in his head. This man is crazy. But no. <laughs> Even before I was married to a woman, I why he said like that? Why he say married to a woman? Why he had to put emphasis on her being a woman? Why not just say even before I was married? Okay. Oh, but I oh oh sorry, he's making reference that he was married to music instead. Oh, okay. Even before I was married to a woman, I was married to my work. Music feeds me more than I can consume sometimes. Mostly it serves me in the way, in the wee hours of night. So my engineers and staffers have to accommodate all night creative sessions because I still struggle with reading and writing. I told y'all why they putting out there that he going to write. He going to write classes. No, he's going to probably, uh, pull up a, a a recorder voice recorder i've got old-fashioned cassette records all around the house in my cars everywhere just like your cameras to catch those moments of pure inspiration when a melody comes to me or some lines of lyrics i've got to get them down fast i have a near perfect memory but i've got so many songs in my head that I've got to catch them as soon as they fight their way to the surface. This nigga's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I'll hum the melody or the bass line, whatever it is that comes to me into the cassette deck or now. Oh my God. What? of my iPhones or iPads. Oh, Lord. Yo, help me with this. I can't help me. I can't help me. Robert. I can't help me. I can't Don't dealing with this. You're killing me, man. <laughs> this is not about music. I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, but I can't do it. Y'all just don't want to believe the truth. You don't want to believe it. At this point, we briefly pause the interview to give Kelly a moment. Of my iPhones or iPads. Or I'll call the studio and have the engineer record my ideas over the phone. From those bits of melody or rhythm or rhyme, I'll continue to build in the studio. I have my longtime musical director, Donnie Lau, who is also an accomplished guitarist. I have a couple of keyboard players and programmers on staff. I'll hum or <laughs> y'all like the uh, Halloween edition. <laughs> oh, it was a with my voice, um, all the parts of the song and Donnie will recreate the song, the sounds in my head on the track. 
as the words come, I'll sing them over the track and keep refining, keep refining and refining until the song is done. I've created a life that basically revolves around music. I'm like that weird scientist who's locked himself in the basement, experimenting, testing, and every every once in a while, blowing up stuff just to get that perfect formula. When the song I Can't Sleep came to me, I originally wanted to cut it with Tony Braxton. Uh, it has her inf in inflections and vocal attitude all over it. Tony had wanted me to produce her. Naturally, I said, yes, I love her voice. When she came into the studio, though, she wasn't happy that I Can't Sleep was already written. She thought we'd be writing together. Well, that's never been my style. I'm the Long Ranger. I prefer to write alone because I'm as much a, a word man as a music man. I have both bases covered and I'm not looking for a collaboration. It's not that I don't recognize the greatness of other writers, but what I do, I do alone. Tony was... Um, unprepared for my way of making music. I just listen to the song first, Tony. I said it'll fit. It'll fit you like a custom-made dress. If I produce a song that fit Michael Jackson, I knew I could produce a song that fit Tony. After listening to, I can't sleep. She said she liked it, but then came the tough part: producing it. Because I had resculptured the melody with Tony in mind, I knew exactly which way it had to go. She just had to follow my roadmap. Except Tony didn't want to follow. Sorry, Rob. She said, I, I don't hear it that way. But Tony, I said, that's the way it's written. Well, I'm, I'm changing it. Then you're ruining it. Just because I'm singing it differently than you want it sung doesn't mean I'm I'm ruining it. It's a hit the way it is written. I insist. I don't think so. Well, I said, you're certainly entitled to your opinion. I'm entitled to take back my song. So I will. At that point, Tony, I agreed to disagree. She realized that like the Lakers and the Celtics, we just weren't going to get along. What well, Tony rejected, I accepted. I recorded. I can't sleep. Myself on my 1995 self-titled album, R. Kelly. It went number one. The down low. Story started with me riding around L.A. where I saw Ronald Isley walking down Sunset uh, Strip. I had my driver stop the car so I could get out and holler at him. Ronald Isley, man, you don't know how much I love your music. You don't know how much my mother loves your music. I bet you don't even know who I am. Are you kidding, brother? You are Kelly. You got the hits. He looked at me like I accomplished what he'd accomplished. I couldn't believe it. Uh-oh. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Mm -hmm. All I could say was, well, I believe I got some hits for you. I'm looking to make the kind of music my people listened to on the porch when we were growing up. You feel me? I feel you, but do I, what do I call you, brother? What does the R stand for? Y'all? It's for Robert, and Robert is ready to roll with the Isleys. Um, if you if the Isleys are ready to roll with the R, we roll now. That very day, we went to the studio where I played some tracks for Ronald. He loved them all. The very first song we did was "Down Low." Mm hmm. Yeah, brother. Yeah. Uh huh. In the closet, trapped in the closet down low okay all right where i sang lead but 
use Ronald and his brother Ernie prominently in the background. Now, you can't help but hear the Isley vibe on the record. I was careful to respectfully label the song down low. Nobody has to know. Featuring Ronald and Ernie Isley. When it came time to make a video, I already knew the whole story. It was like a movie in my head. When I wrote the song, I was the young dude kicking it with the with the woman of a a superb uh, of a super bad gangster named Mr. Biggs. I cast Ronald in the role of Mr. Biggs, and suddenly, both his face and his voice were back in the media. He told me that the song and the music video propelled him into a whole new career. Hanging with Ronald was like being with a teacher. I always learned something new from him. Like any writer or director, I took great pride in giving the Mr. Biggs character life. The Isley Brothers were one of my mom's favorite groups. I was truly humbled to work with them. My only regret was that my mom couldn't see her baby boy singing with the Isleys. Just as down low had me looking to the past my collaboration with the notorious blg you to be be happy on the same album had me looking to the future i saw that staying in the present i could ride on both sides of the road new flavor old school r&b and rap heavy hip-hop The R is for Robert, and Robert is ready to roll with the Isleys if the Isleys are ready to roll with the R. Nope. <laughs> go there. Go there. Herpy face. Herpy, herpy, herpy. All I see. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Long are the days of that face. <laughs> ah. All right, we're going to stop here on page 203. God and music. God and music music okay thank you guys so very much <laughs> for joining me on this read okay um i doubt i'll be back this evening because i will be um doing uh, music and combos uh with whitney d you guys will join me tonight at 8 p.m same bad place just a different bad time okay join me at 8 p.m central standard time here tonight we're gonna have fun we're gonna have an open discussion um angelo clary said he's gonna pull through we're gonna have a good good time okay i pray that I, I i was reading successfully for you guys okay but this is october we're gonna have some fun okay um but not for nothing you guys thank you guys so very much for joining me for this read I hope I didn't stumble and fumble over too many words, okay? <laughs> Not for nothing. If you guys would like to reach me, you can reach me at reviewswithwinnyd at gmail.com. For any questions, concerns, and our comments pertaining to any kind of collaborations, any business um, thoughts or promotions or what have you, reach me at reviewswithwinnyd at gmail.com. Now, if you're looking for some kind of business needs pertaining to websites, logos, intro, outros, banners for your YouTube channel, hit me up at WhitneyDavisPlanning.com or WhitneyDavisPlanning at gmail.com and I would assure you that I will get back to you, okay? 
Um, not for nothing, you guys. Thank you so very much. I pray that I see you guys tonight. Okay, if nothing more, you guys be safe and be blessed and know that the best is still yet to come for you. Okay, love you guys. Hopefully see you tonight. Deuces. Not none, dog. Store like that. I ain't got none. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. Yeah. I want a cookie. Ain't got none. Stupid. Don't me with this. I got you out of here. Robert. briefly pause the interview to give Kelly a moment.